Ambassador Ron Dermer was born and raised in Miami Beach, Florida, earned degrees in finance and management from the Wharton School, and degrees in philosophy, politics, and economics from Oxford University. It would make Jewish parents very proud. <laughs> a talented thinker, a prodigious writer. He was a columnist for the Jerusalem Post, and in 2004, he co-authored with Natan Sharansky the best-selling book, The Case for Democracy, The Power of Freedom to Overcome Tyranny and Terror. We probably need to read it now again. From 2005 to 2008, Ambassador Dermer served as Israel's <coughs> Minister of Economic Affairs here in the United States. And from 2009 to 2013, he was Senior Advisor to Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. And since then, he has served ably and with incisive leadership as the Israeli Ambassador to the United States. And he is a committed Jew an observant Jew with a beautiful family. He's married to Rhoda, has five beautiful children, and he's home for Shabbat. But most of all, everything I've learned about you, Ambassador, is that you possess, you are the embodiment of what we read in rabbinic tradition. It's called Ahavat Yisrael. Ahavat Israel is love for Israel in all of its manifestations. And we know, Ambassador, that this Ahavat Israel for you knows no bounds. Ladies and gentlemen, His Excellency Ambassador Ron Thurman. Thank you. Uh, Rob, and thank you especially for making clear that people should read my book again. They are available on Amazon. Um, I also want to thank Ron. Um, just remember, two Rons don't make a right. <laughs> but I want to thank both of you for your leadership in this community, in this committed community. So I've been looking forward to visiting in this community. This is the first time, even though I was born and raised in the United States, that I've ever been to New Mexico. I thought that this was the first time that a sitting ambassador of Israel to the United States had been to New Mexico, but someone told me earlier that Moshe Arad was here some three decades ago, uh, and uh, maybe it is fitting that I would be here in the week that Moshe Arad dies, because he died a few days ago, for those of you who don't know, and so I will dedicate my remarks to his memory of a very fine diplomat, former ambassador uh, to the United States and to Mexico. Uh, how many, show of hands, how many people were here when Moshe Aron came? So that's your answer about whether people remember, they do. So, but it's been 30 years since a sitting ambassador has been to this community and I'm honored uh, to be here. I wanted to come here to address uh, this community as I've done in so many other communities, and I've been privileged to do that during my now seven year tenure. I'm in my seventh year as Israel's ambassador to the United States. And it gives me an opportunity to speak about the many challenges that are facing Israel. And there are always very, very serious challenges facing Israel. Unfortunately, we haven't reached the point where we're surrounded uh, by neighbors who we are at peace with haven't reached that moment. I believe one day we will, but we're not there yet. And so we have many challenges facing Israel. Foremost among those challenges is Iran and the security challenge that Iran poses to us. That's a regime in Iran that calls openly and works actively for the destruction of Israel. And they, even in recent days, reiterated their commitment to destroying the one and only Jewish state. It's a regime that seeks nuclear weapons and seeks regional domination. And the nuclear deal that was made a few years ago didn't stop Iran's pursuit of nuclear weapons, unfortunately. 
Had there been a deal that would have actually blocked Iran's path to nuclear weapons, I, as Israel's ambassador, would have been the first person to support that deal and would have gone community to community, house to house, to get people to support it. But the reason that we opposed it was because that's not what the deal does. It just puts temporary restrictions that are removed in a few years. And in addition, it also freed up Iran from the sanctions regime, the very, very heavy sanctions regime uh, it was under at the time, and that helped fuel Iran's regional aggression. And we see that aggression in Iraq, and in Syria, and in Lebanon, and in Yemen, and in Gaza, and throughout the region. And for, I don't know, there are many issues, internal issues in the United States, but I hope people here can understand why the people of Israel, and this is very broad, it transcends our ideolo different ideologies and the political map in Israel, why we are very grateful in Israel for President Trump's decision to withdraw from the nuclear deal and reimpose sanctions. That has starved a regime that is committed to our destruction of billions and billions and billions, tens of billions of dollars. Uh, and we are grateful. It hasn't solved the problem of Iran. Iran is poor because of that decision, but they're still very, very dangerous. And Israel has to be very vigilant against Iran, which continues to lash out, continues to try to keep the sanctions from getting harder and maybe convincing people to remove the sanctions again. And they attacked oil fields in Saudi Arabia and shipping lanes and American drones. And I don't think they've, they're done yet. And they continue to work against Israel, as I said, in all of these fronts, trying to entrench themselves in Syria through Hezbollah, their proxy in Lebanon, by supporting Palestinian terror groups in Gaza. But rest assured that Israel is determined to defend itself against the threat Iran poses in any theater. It doesn't matter where they seek to launch attacks against us. We will do whatever we have to do to defend ourselves. Now, security is not the only challenge facing Israel. We also face the challenge of making a secure peace with our Palestinian neighbors. This year, we celebrate 40 years of peace with Egypt. Many of you probably remember a world when Israel wasn't at peace with Egypt, and it was a more dangerous world for Israelis who fought multiple wars with our southern neighbor. And this year, we celebrate 25 years of peace with Jordan, and we're grateful for that. And we would like to expand that circle of peace to all of our Arab neighbors including our Palestinian neighbors. And there are many positive changes, and maybe we'll talk a little bit about them later, that are currently happening in the Arab world. And many forces there appreciate that Israel is not their enemy, but a potential ally in standing together against common enemies. Israel faces internal challenges of integrating our ultra-Orthodox population and also Israeli Arabs into our country. I think the last time I saw the statistics, around 50% of first graders in Israel belong in those two communities. So this is an issue that's going to affect our future and whether or not Israel succeeds at integrating those two communities, ultra-Orthodox and Israeli Arabs, is going to play a big role in our continued success. Now Israel faces the challenge of rising anti-Semitism across the world. You saw that anti-Semitism in Charlottesville in 2017. You saw it in Pittsburgh, whose one-year anniversary you marked a week ago when 11 Jews were massacred in the synagogue there. Now, it's not a new problem. Sometimes we get so locked into certain views that we can't take a step back and see a problem for what it is. In 2014 and 2015, attacks against Jews represented over half the attacks against religious, uh, religiously motivated attacks in the United States. Now, Jews represent about 2% of the population, but it counted for over half 
the attacks. And so this is a problem that has been growing in the United States for a number of years, and it's growing all over the world. And you see that in Europe, where it's commonplace attacks against Jews, in France, in Germany, in Britain. And in Britain, there was a leader of a major party who I have a hard time not describing as an anti-Semite. And I don't use that word very often. You can Google how many times I've used that word. You have to really, to put that label on somebody, you have to be sure that's what they are. And it's hard for me to not use that label against the leader of the Labor Party in Britain. And it's important for us to confront the hatred of Jews wherever it comes, whether it comes from the right or whether it comes from the left. And it's important for us, whatever side of the political aisle we are, to actually call out the anti-Semites on that side. We also have the challenge of the insidious BDS movement, which is an anti-Semitic movement. That's what it is because it seeks to single out the state of Israel alone among nations of the world for boycott, divestment, and sanction. When I get asked as Israel's ambassador, what do I think about this or that group that's boycotting Israel? Could be an academic group, could be a church group or another group. I ask always the same question, what number are we on their list? That's what I wanna know. Are we number 25, 45, 75 countries around the world? that they have decided to boycott? Because if we are number 25 or whatever, then I know that they have a standard, some principle, and they've cast their net around the globe and they have included Israel. They put Israel on that list. And I think my job as Israel's ambassador is to educate them, is to explain why Israel shouldn't be on that list, shouldn't be included, and to give them all the context and the nuance and the history but when I hear that one of these international organizations or university has only one country on their list, then I don't go and engage them because there's a principle for having only Jews on your list. There's a name for that, and it's called antisemitism. The mark of antisemitism was historically the attempt to single out the Jewish people for special discriminatory treatment. And that is exactly what the BDS movement does to Israel. Now, almost all the leaders of the BDS movement want to eliminate the state of Israel. They say so openly for anyone who bothers to actually do a Google search. They have some fellow travelers who don't want to destroy the state of Israel who were just fools, who were useful idiots, and moral idiots, I should say, in this struggle. But we have a real challenge to expose this old anti-Semitism with a brand new face, and to fight it through state legislatures, through legislation, but community after community to stand against it, and to not allow this evil to resurface, because we've seen what it does in our history. And of course, Israel has the challenge of ensuring that we always remain a country open to every single Jew, whether they are traditional or secular, orthodox, conservative or reform, to address a lot of the issues that have long been swept under the rug. Conversion is one of them. You probably in this community know many others. But how can we ensure that Israel is a place where every Jew in the around the world can feel that unique connection that we have to it? How do we ensure that everyone can call, every Jew around the world can call Israel home? Now we also have the challenge nowadays of actually trying to have a government to deal with any of these challenges. <laughs> you know, I used to, sometimes remark about Israel's political instability, but please, this is sort of off the charts. I, have, I do have an idea, though, a suggestion. I figure we in Israel solve Brexit. We think the British can handle the whole impeachment issues here, and maybe the Americans can form a coalition in Israel. And that way, if everybody's dealing 
with everybody else's problems, maybe we'll solve something. So Israel has many challenges, and many of you probably have many questions about those challenges, and I know we're going to have time for me to answer those questions. But because an Israeli ambassador to the United States does not come to Albuquerque every day, but comes once a generation, I thought I would use a few minutes not just to talk about the challenges Israel faces, but to tell you why I am so optimistic about Israel's future, our ability to meet all those challenges, and then some. Now, this is going to be hard for you to hear because we Jews have a unique capacity to see the glass as 1 empty. We do. You all know it. But the truth is, is the glass is overflowing. And there are so many reasons for optimism. Now, in February this past year, I was at Cape Canaveral. And I was there for the launch of an Israeli-made spacecraft on its way to the moon. Now, I insist Israel landed on the moon. We crash landed, <laughs> but we landed. You know, if soft landings are all you can handle, then Israel's not the place for you. <laughs> but we landed on the moon, and we became the fourth country to achieve that goal. China, Russia, of course America, in Israel, a couple hundred million people, 300 million people, a billion people, and a country the size of New Jersey with 9 million people are the countries that have made it to the moon. So when you say the skies are the limit, not for Israel, we're going to go well beyond that. Last um, year, rankings come out, and they come out every year, of powerful countries around the world. Israel ranked eighth. Eighth. You had the five permanent members of the UN Security Council, Russia, United States, China, Britain, France, Germany, Japan, and then Israel. Now, this ranking was not made by the local Hadassah chapter in Nashville. Not that I have anything against Hadassah. By the way, I am a now member of Hadassah. I did not realize that men could get into Hadassah, but at a convention that they did in Washington, they made me a member. So I'm very, it's sort of Groucho Marx thing that I won't, don't want to be in a club that would have me as a member, but uh, it's a wonderful organization. But this wasn't uh, the list of a local chapter of a Jewish organization. And Israel is one of the more powerful countries in the world. We are strong militarily, and we are getting stronger, both offensively and defensively. We are the only country in the Middle East that flies the Joint Strike Fighter, which is made in a neighboring state. And we've developed tremendous defensive systems, the missile defense systems of Iron Dome, which I know in another neighboring state, in Tucson, they manufacture uh, the Iron Dome missile defense system. And we have David Sling. And we have the Aero system. And we are very grateful to the United States for decades of support. Not always, not in those first two decades. We, people don't know this. We didn't receive a lot of assistance to our military. Israel fought the 1948 war with Czech rifles. Not because the Czechs make better rifles, because the United States would not sell them to us. I mentioned President Truman, and he was the first leader around the world to recognize the newly established state of Israel, but America had an arms embargo on Israel at that time. And maybe some of your parents and grandparents helped smuggle weapons to Israel, in addition to putting those coins in those boxes to help. Uh, young country fighting for its life survive. And we fought 
in the 1967 war, the Six Day War, with French planes, not because the French make better planes, because America wouldn't sell us planes at the time. But today, America provides us with a Joint Strike Fighter, with missile defense funding, very generous, and I was very proud as ambassador when we were able to reach an agreement and very grateful to the previous administration, the Obama administration, for an agreement of 10 years of continued military assistance uh, to Israel that he signed as president. So Israel is very strong militarily with one of the finest intelligence services in the world. You saw last year some of the evidence of that when the Iranians woke up one day and found that their archive, their nuclear archive, where they were hiding most of their secrets, had disappeared. And many other things that Israel does to keep our own citizens safe, but also countries around the world. Israeli intelligence has foiled some two dozen major terrorist attacks in countries around the world. Two dozen. And by major, I mean a plane falling out of the sky, 150 being, 150 people being killed. Israeli intelligence foils attacks after attack after attack after attack. So we have a very powerful military and a formidable intelligence service. We're also powerful because of our economy. Israel is a global technological power. And this is a fundamental transformation to where we were in 1948, when we had the same GDP as Egypt and Jordan. Today, Israel has a higher GDP per capita than Japan, than the average European country. And we are not only a strong economy, we are an innovative economy. Forty of the, of over 40 of the 50 leading technology companies in the world have R&D facilities in Israel. And for many of them, it's the only R&D center that they have outside the United States. Israel's become a global technological power in agriculture, in water, in cyber. Now Israel's one-tenth of one percent of the world's population. That's it. And we account for 20 percent of global private investment in cybersecurity. So in cyber, Israel is punching 200 times above its weight. In cyber, that 9 million strong country is bigger than a China. And there are also so many other technologies of the future where Israel is charging ahead, like autonomous vehicles. We have a blossoming and flourishing car industry in Israel. We have about 300 companies who are working on all the technology, all the smart vehicles. Some of you, you probably all know the directions around here, but some of you may be using Waze, an Israeli company that was bought for a meager billion dollars. But we'll have many more Wazes in the future as this industry, this ecosystem that's working on autonomous vehicles takes root in Israel. We also have many companies dealing with artificial intelligence. I said there were four countries that have been on the moon. Those are the four countries that are leading the way in artificial intelligence. United States, China, Russia, and Israel. And at this nexus, this world where big data, interconnectivity, and artificial intelligence all come together, Israel is poised to seize the future in a way Perhaps no other country in the world outside the United States is. Israel is also strong diplomatically. That's something you don't hear every day. People were used for many years to hearing the story about Israel's increasing isolation, right? How many New York Times articles did you read about Israel becoming more and more isolated? Ridiculous. We are less isolated than we've ever been. Israel's ties are expanding dramatically across the world with India, with China, with Japan, South America, Africa, Russia, European countries. Everywhere you look, people are deepening their ties with Israel. 
And the reason why they're doing it is they want access to Israeli technology. And they want our help in dealing with their security challenges, in dealing with the threats of terrorism that they face because of our security capabilities and our technological capabilities, Israel is rising as a power on the world stage. And it's fundamentally transforming our relations with countries around the world. Now, you haven't seen that translated yet in international forums like the United Nations, but it's coming. You know, we were waiting for a long time for a tailwind from Washington. And for two years, we got a tailwind. Her name is Hurricane Haley. And she did a terrific job as Nikki Haley, as America's ambassador to the United Nations, standing firm with, of course, the full support of President Trump, but standing firm for Israel and helping transform and quicken the pace of the change in, of Israel's standing in international form. Now, I believe that the day will come where we will crack the automatic majorities against Israel, because those automatic majorities were made in a different era when Israel was not important to all these countries. The reason why our ties are flourishing is not because a wave of Zionism has spread across the planet. It's because those countries need what we have to give them. And eventually that will be translated into voting patterns in international institutions. Well, what I just told you about now, about our military, about our economy, about our diplomacy, that's power. That's a conversation about power. What about values? We're the Jewish state. What about Israel's values? You hear all the time, an assault on Israel's values, the questioning of Israel's democracy. If I had a nickel for every time I read an article in a newspaper about how Israel's values are not once they were, one, what they once were, after the forces of darkness are taking over, in Israel I'd be a very wealthy man. It's all nonsense. I could not be more proud of Israel's democracy. Not because we are perfect. Israel is not perfect. No country is perfect. I'm proud of Israel's democracy because I understand that a democracy's values are tested most when they are under fire. That's when it counts. And I think about how Israel has passed that test with flying colors. You remember here what the situation was like in the United States on September 12, 2001? You remember when there was a perception that another attack would be imminent? And how people were so concerned about their security, they were willing to make certain sacrifices with their civil liberties. That's normal. That's how a normal country behaves. And then as the danger receded, which it thankfully did, people wanted that pendulum to swing back. And they guarded those civil liberties, which is also normal. But remember that Israel has been in September 12th for over 71 years. And I, as a son of America, who was raised at the altar of this great democracy, I marvel at what Israel has been able to achieve. I marvel that it has been able to uphold its values under the most extreme circumstances, circumstances that have tested no nation, and we look back at even American history, this great country, the greatest force for good of any country the world has ever known, period, with all its flaws. And you can spend all day talking about all the imperfections of this nation, but you have to have no sense of history to not appreciate what a force for good America has been in the world. 
But with all that, you look back at certain episodes in American history when there was a real fear of security challenges and how certain civil liberties were thrown out the window. And people look back decades later and apologize for it and regret it. But Israel's in that state now, in real time. And that's why I, I so marvel at Israel's democracy. And many, maybe many decades from now, maybe when we're at peace with our neighbors, people will look back at this period and marvel like I do that a country like Israel could uphold its values under this mo the most extreme circumstances. And that's why I, as Israel's ambassador, never apologize for Israel's democracy. I celebrate it. And I couldn't be prouder of it. And I could not be prouder of our contributions to the world. That fabulous technology that I talked about, it's in your computers and your cell phones and your medicine cabinets and it's transforming lives for the better around the world that's feeding so many countries that are hungry that are quenching the thirst of so many peoples who are thirsty and the science and medicine that is pushing the bounds the boundaries of knowledge helping find cures for Parkinson's and multiple sclerosis and hopefully cancers. If I had to bet on where the cure, if you can call it that, for cancer will come from, I'd bet on Israel. And I also am proud of Israel's compassion, how we took people bleeding from Syria and we took them into our country and we gave by the hundreds and now a couple of thousand people medical treatment. Didn't show their face because they'd be harmed when, they sent, when we sent them back. How we treated people who were suffering and how we are the first to arrive after natural disasters in places like Haiti and Nepal and Mexico. So I'm very proud of Israel's values, and not just its power. But not only am I proud of those things, most importantly, I am grateful for Israel. The strongest feeling I have is not pride, it is gratitude. And I think all Jews should feel that gratitude because we live at a time we are blessed to live at a time when there is a sovereign Jewish state. Now, sovereignty means many things. It's a big word. But to me, above all, it means three things. First, it means that the Jewish people have a voice. You know, the most remarkable thing about being Israel's ambassador is that there are Israeli ambassadors that the Jewish people have a voice. Because it used to be we had to ask others to make our case. We had to plead with a Polish diplomat to go to Washington to speak to a senior official in the Roosevelt administration and tell him about what was going on. Today we don't need to do that. Today we get to make our own case. And people have not actually fully understood this shift. All the time people come to me. It happens every couple of weeks. Somebody will tell me, uh, Mr. Ambassador, you know, I know somebody who knows the senator, so maybe I can figure out how to put you two together. And I say, I really appreciate that. But if I want to call the senator, I'll pick up a phone. And the reason why I'll why they will answer that phone is not because of me personally, it's because I have the privilege of representing the sovereign Jewish state of Israel. So the first thing is that the Jewish people have a voice. That's what Israel gave the Jewish people. The second thing Israel gave us 
is a refuge. I know a lot of people are asking a lot of questions about this rising tide of anti-Semitism in the world. Where does it come from? What does it mean? How do we deal with it? How do we fight it? But the one question people are not asking was the question Jews were asking for centuries, which is where are we going to go? That was the question that Jewish communities across the world were fixated on for centuries. When the inevitable wave of anti-Semitism comes, where are we going to go? And the reason why they don't ask that question anymore is because Israel is an answer. It may not be the answer. And we hope all governments will take action to fight anti-Semitism and the Jews will be safe wherever they choose to live. But every Jew in the world should know that Israel is a refuge. And it has been refuge, a refuge for Jews fleeing the killing fields of Europe, for Jews who were thrown out of the Middle East and North Africa, for the Ethiopian Jews who we airlifted into Israel. It always amazes me when Israel is accused of being a racist country. We were the only country in the history of the world who took blacks out of Africa to freedom. The only one. And when the Iron Curtain fell, we welcomed a million Jews from the former Soviet Union. And today, if anti-Semitism strikes in France or in the Ukraine, our gates are open and will remain open. So the first thing Israel gave us was a voice. The second it gave us was a refuge. But the most important thing Israel gave us was a shield. For 2,000 years, the Jewish people had to beg the local policeman or the magistrate to protect us from pogroms and massacres. We had to beg kings, prime ministers, and presidents to save our community to bomb the tracks. Today, the Jewish people do not beg others to defend them. Today, the Jewish people defend themselves. That is the meaning of sovereignty. That is the meaning of being privileged to live at a time when there is a sovereign Jewish state. So the glass is not 1 16th empty. It is overflowing. And one thing I hope you will do, before you think about all the challenges Israel faces, before you think about all our problems, I hope you will remember how fortunate you are to live at a time when there is a sovereign Jewish state. A hundred generations of Jews dreamed about living at such a time. Three generations of Jews have been privileged to live that dream. And with that privilege comes, in my view, a great responsibility. And it is not a responsibility that rests on the shoulders of prime ministers or ambassadors. It rests on the shoulders of each and every one of you. And that is to secure that dream for future generations. And by being here tonight, by strengthening this Jewish community right here in Albuquerque, you become partners with the Jewish state in securing the Jewish future. Thank you. answer a few questions, right? Unless you're done with me.
this question. With all Not that one. I don't want to answer that. <laughs> the second one reads very much like the first one. <laughs> with all the focus in the Israeli and Amer in, in Israel and America on Israeli politics and the ongoing impasse in the peace process, all the good things happening in Israel are easily fixed. What is new and exciting in Israel right now? And you've given us. I think I answered some of that stuff, so maybe we'll go to the next question, but look, Israel, I'll just say more generally, it's one of the reasons why I moved to Israel 25 years ago, because Israel's the most exciting place on earth. It's actually not even close, and those of you who, how many people have been to Israel here? How many people have not been to Israel? That's small. Well, it looks like you got your next mission right there. You at least have five or six people going with you, but those of you who have been to Israel know how exciting a place is and how alive it is. It, days in Israel, it's like measured in dog years. So if you're in Israel for two weeks, you, you know, you'll feel like you've been there for three or four months because there's so much excitement and so many things going on. I tell people, when I try to explain to them about the, what's going on in Israel, I say Israel's so exciting that Israelis go to Manhattan to unwind. <laughs> And the Israelis here always ask, the Israelis who I said, why is that funny? Like they don't understand, oh yeah, of course. That's how we relax in Manhattan, because it's so exciting. And actually, I have a confession after the, uh, I, we have a Rosh Hashanah event every year. So when I did the Rosh Hashanah event in 2017, which was the first year of the Trump administration, I said, this is hard for me to admit after 69 years, which it was, Israel was at the time, that for the first time, Israel's become more boring than America. So one of the reasons why we did this whole political crisis, I think, is just because we want to get the prize back. We want the title back of the most exciting country. But it's very exciting, it's very vibrant, and there's always new and exciting things happening in Israel, and it's contagious. Those of you who have been there, I'm sure you, second you leave, you, you get the feeling you come back that you just sort of decompress and you want to sort of connect and reconnect with all the remarkable things that are taking place in Israel. So it's very exciting, and it's going to get more exciting in the future. How do you define Zionism? Oh, a, a nice, simple question. How do I? It actually is pretty simple. Uh, Zionism, to me, is the right of the Jewish people to self-determination in the land of Israel. That's what Zionism If you are a Zionist, you believe in that right. Now, what I will say to that is a couple of things. First of all, about the rise of anti-Zionism. Now, when I hear, you get some, sometimes you hear this happen in the Jewish community that there's some voices that are anti-Zionist, and they say, doesn't that concern you? And I say, well, compared to what? Compared to five years ago, 10 years ago, or compared to 100 years ago? Because 100 years ago, most Jews across the world were not Zionists. When Herzl, had his idea for Zionism, he represented a tiny fraction of the Jewish world. There were many answers to what people thought was a serious problem of the Jewish problem, as it was called, from Jew by Jews and non-Jews. And some people said, well, the way that we're going to solve this problem is assimilation. That's the path towards being treated like all the other nations. Because everyone said, we have this problem being Jews, being different, being separate, and we need, want to be treated like all the other nations. So one group of Jews had the idea of assimilation. That's the path to being treated like all the nations. Another group of Jews, sometimes from the same family, brothers, chose the path of communism. The way we're going to be like all the nations is to get rid of nations. There will be no separations, no different nations, no different religions. And then there was the path of Zionism. It says the way that we'll be like all the nations would be by having a state of our own. That's how we'll be treated like all the nations. Now, where I differ from some of those Zionists is I have no desire to make the Jews like all the other nations. Anyone who tries to do that will fail. The Jews are not a people like all other peoples. If you don't believe me, and you don't want to take the Bible as proof, just look at a few thousand years of history. But I do believe that we need 
the normalcy of a state, of a sovereign state, with an army, with a court, with the ability to control borders so that we can allow Jews from all over the world to come in. We need the normal means of a state to continue to be an exceptional nation. That is Zionism to me. But strictly defined, it is the right of the Jewish people to self-determination in the land of Israel. And there are arguments, by the way, of what the Jewish people is. And there are even arguments of what the land of Israel is. And that's fine. What you can't do is argue about self-determination. Either the people of Israel have a right to choose their own destiny, or they don't. If you are a Zionist, then you respect the right of the Jewish people in the land of Israel to choose their own future. Now, so you don't, what that means is you don't try to impose something on the people of Israel that they reject. Those who would seek to do that, whether you are on the right or on the left, are in my view not Zionists. Zionism is allowing the Jewish people in that land to determine and decide their own future, whether right or wrong. That's what it means to be a sovereign country, to make decisions, right decisions or wrong decisions, not to believe that you know what's better for them and to impose it on them for their sake. A lot of people who hope to save Israel from itself, no thank you. We are a free country. We have a pretty good idea of how to conduct our lives. We understand the security challenges we face. We understand the trade-offs we have to make. And we make choices. And sometimes the Israeli system goes one way and sometimes it goes the other, but those choices have to be respected. There is a different relationship with Jews around the world. Because Jews are in a unique circumstance that you are not if you're not Israeli, you're not citizens of the country, but you are potential citizens tomorrow. There is an umbilical cord that connects the state of Israel to all of you. And that means, in my personal view, it means that you have, while you don't have a vote, you have a voice. And that Israel has to take that voice seriously because we are connected in a different way. And all I would recommend is to the extent that you are raising that voice when Israel is in danger, to the extent you are supporting Israel during its most difficult moments, your criticism of this or that decision in Israel will be heard because we will know that it's the criticism of a friend. But those people who only raise their voice in criticism, no one in Israel wants to hear from them. If they can't appreciate what I talked about in this speech. If they cannot be grateful for a minute and understand how precious this gift is to have a sovereign Jewish state and how careful they should be in simply treating Israel as a punching bag, as Jews, then people in Israel, leaders in Israel, are not going to hear what they have to say. But you who are in communities across the world who have been great defenders, at critical moments, we do want to hear what you have to say. And we may not always agree, but we'll listen to what you have to say. And it's important for us to hear it. And it's important for you to tell us what you uh, have to say. So that is a very short answer to a long question about Zion. <laughs> the next question could be longer. Yeah. Uh, since the founding of the State of Israel in 1948, there has been a great power, historically, the U.S., as convener and guarantor in negotiation. As we see more commercial and security investment between Israel and the so-called confrontation states, has the need for involvement by the great power changed? And so, how? Well, first of all, we're, we're very appreciative of the support that we've gotten from the United States, excuse me, over the years. Uh, the great power. You know, we haven't had uh, really a great power on our side beside the United States. We did have France for the first couple of decades who was aligned more with Israel at that time until de Gaulle sort of flipped things, you know, and overnight uh, and changed his position and decided that he would 
move away from Israel and move towards the Arab world and therefore shifted uh, France's policies. But America has been our one true uh, great friend. But as I mentioned before, for two decades we did not receive a great deal of uh, U.S. assistance, not military assistance, not economic assistance. We got the moral support of presidents like Harry Truman or John Kennedy uh, and others. We got some diplomatic support that was critical at critical periods. But we actually, I would say that we didn't get a lot from the United States. We didn't give a lot to the United States for the first two decades. And then for about four decades, the relationship changed and we had established this partnership uh, during the Cold War. When Israel proved itself successful on the battlefield, then the United States started investing a lot more in Israel. When we made the peace agreement with Egypt, the United States wanted to make sure, rightly so, that Israel would emerge stronger after that peace agreement, giving back this strategically vital territory that's about three times the size of Israel and that also had oil there. We gave that up to Egypt for peace, but the United States wanted to make sure that we emerged stronger, and so then you had, that's when the, the big assistance that we received from the United States really began in the wake of the Yom Kippur War and then especially after the peace treaty that we signed with Egypt. Um, and nowadays our relationship with the United States has taken another step because over the last decade Israel's become one of the most important allies of the United States. And I think Israel will be the most important ally of the United States in the 21st century because of security and because of technology. That said, we have needed the United States in our efforts to advance peace. In the case of Egypt, I mean, we haven't been able to do it totally on our own. In the case of Egypt, we began it on our own. In fact, some people will argue that the reason why you had a breakthrough in the peace process was because of concerns in Israel and Egypt for what uh, then the Carter administration might potentially do. And so therefore you had this breakthrough with Sadat and Begin, but President Carter deserves credit because once the breakthrough happened in order to finalize it, we really needed U.S. facilitation at Camp David. Uh, in the case of Jordan, that was a de facto peace that was just waiting for some a small breakthrough with the Palestinians in order to turn into a de jure peace. But when the situation happened with the Palestinians, there too you did not have the U.S. as being part of it at the beginning. The breakthrough actually happened between Israel and the Palestinians, and then the United States tried to come through the Clinton administration and was not able to for the simple reason that the Palestinians were not interested in making peace. I would say more generally, the U.S. remains, I think, the one party internationally that can help facilitate a potential uh, peace between Israel and certainly the Palestinians, and maybe between Israel and our Arab neighbors. But I will never blame any American president or any American secretary of state or any American peace envoy for the failure to achieve peace between Israelis and Palestinians. Those people who do that simply don't understand what our conflict is all about. The reason why we have a conflict is the same reason why the Arab world rejected the offer that was made on November 29, 1947. Now, it was two states for two peoples. Then they didn't call it a Palestinian state. Then it was called an Arab state. The Palestinians didn't call themselves Palestinians then. That's why it doesn't appear. But it says an Arab state and a Jewish state. And then none of the issues that people think are relevant for peacemaking and think are the reasons why there's not peace, none of the issues were there. There weren't refugees. The War of Independence hadn't started yet. There weren't the post-67 settlements that everyone talks about. Not even Jerusalem was the issue because that was a separate part of the decision. It was going to be an internationalized city. It's just very simple. Do you recognize the right of a Jewish state in the land of Israel? Are you a Zionist? Do you believe in the right of the Jewish people to self-determination in the land of Israel? And the answer was no then, and unfortunately it's been no since then. And we will not have peace until the Palestinians cross a Rubicon and recognize our right to a nation state in our historic homeland. It won't happen no matter how talented the envoy is. No matter how you think you're gonna reshuffle all the so-called final status issues, the Palestinians have to cross this historic Rubicon 
to recognize that the Jewish people are in the land of Israel not by might, but by right. What they think is, and what they teach their children, is that we have stolen their land. They teach them the lie that the Jewish people are foreign colonialists in the land of Israel. They try to convince them that just like the British were in India and the French were in Algeria and the Belgians were in the Congo, that the Jews are in Israel. And this is why, by the way, that they go through such great lengths to deny any connection between the Jewish people and the land of Israel. You ask yourself why they do this. Yasser Arafat said to President Clinton at Camp David, he said, there never was a temple on the Temple Mount. And Clinton sort of laughed about it. He couldn't even believe what he was hearing. And you hear Abu Mazen, the leader of the Palestinians, President Abbas, will come to the United Nations and he'll never mention a connection between the Jewish people and the land of Israel. And a lot of the negotiators don't really understand why. I'll tell you why. Because they rec if they recognize the connection between the Jewish people and that land, then the entire scaffolding of Palestinian rejectionism collapses. And just how little this is understood, I'll tell you uh, a story. We have time? We have a few minutes to tell a story? Yeah. So, a few years ago, right before I became ambassador, it was 2013, I was approached by a, a peace envoy, who will be nameless, And he came, John Kerry was just starting his peace efforts to sort of bring the parties together, Secretary of State. And this person was very concerned with what would potentially happen at the United Nations when both the Prime Minister Netanyahu and President Abbas were, were due to give speeches. Because he wanted to make sure that the speeches would use to help move the process forward rather than to undermine the very delicate process that they were starting. So he came to me as somebody who he thought would have some role to play in the Prime Minister's speech at the United Nations. And he asked me, he said, what would you like to hear President Abbas say in his speech? And he told me, or he asked me, what, what would you like to hear President Abbas say? And tried to tell me what they wanted to hear Prime Minister Netanyahu say. And I said, that's a very good idea. I thought it was a very good thing to do. Let's see if President Abbas could say something that would be important to the Israeli people, and maybe Prime Minister Netanyahu could say something that would be important for Palestinians. So he told me what they wanted Prime Minister Netanyahu to say. So he said, what would you like President Abbas to say? I said, I'll tell you, it's very simple. I don't think he's going to recognize the Jewish state in a speech at the United Nations. He hadn't done it at that point for many years. And I didn't think there would be a breakthrough there, but I asked him to do two things. First, I'd like to hear President Abbas say that the Jews are a people, not just a religion. Why is that important? Because people have, peoples have a right to self-determination, religions don't. Say the Jews are a people. Second, talk about a connection between the Jewish people and the land of Israel. Forget about what happened in the last hundred years. He doesn't have to mention anything about this century conflict with the Palestinians. Talk about Jews praying towards Jerusalem three times a day. Talk about the kings of Israel or the prophets of Israel going through those hills. Anything. So he listened to what I had to say and he said to me, well, I think that's doable. And I said, no, it's not. It's not. And here was somebody who has been involved in the peace process for a quarter century and didn't realize the simplest thing, that this is an ideological conflict that is deeply rooted and deeply rooted in the idea that we have no right to be there. Of course, he called me back a few days later. He says, you know, we're right. He's, you're right. He wasn't willing to say it. No, he's not willing to say it. They're very clever about their language. And they have convinced the world that they have reasonable positions. But at the core, the conflict remains exactly what it was 
72 years ago. The only question continues to be, do they recognize the right of the Jewish people to self-determination in the land of Israel? Somebody said to me, well, you're saying that they have to be Zionists. I said, yes. In my understanding of what that means, they have to say we have a right to be there. They can say, by the way, that they have a right to be there too. I don't ask them to deny their right. They can say, we have a claim, you have a claim. Now, if somebody says the house is 1% yours and 99% mine, we're in a negotiation. But when they say you stole my house, there's no way of reaching any type of an agreement. So as much as we are grateful to the United States for everything they do to help facilitate peace, um, ultimately, the Palestinians are going to have to cross that Rubicon. And the best thing that the United States and the rest of the worst world can do is to not coddle the Palestinians and to pretend that they're saying things that they're not. To not allow President Abbas to come to the United Nations and to deny history, to deny reality. And this, by the way, is the reason why the decision to recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel and to move the American embassy is so important to the advance of peace. Because this denial of our legitimacy is everywhere, but nowhere more than in Jerusalem, where the Palestinians say the Jews are trying to Judaify Jerusalem. It's interesting. It's like the Chinese trying to sinify Beijing. <laughs> the Russians trying to Russify Moscow. We are Judaizing Jerusalem. A thousand years before the birth of Jesus, 1,500 years before the birth of Muhammad, King David ruled in Jerusalem. This is where our kings ruled and our prophets preached and where our patriarchs prayed. And when the President of the United States comes with this decision, a lot of people said, well, this is going to undermine the efforts to advance peace. Well, if you think you just have to get the right lineup of the final status issues, when you'll think, yeah, he's undermining peace because he's moving too far this way and not enough that way. Nonsense. If you understand what I said before, that the reason why we don't have peace is the refusal to recognize the legitimacy of a Jewish state, then you understand that his decision to recognize Jerusalem as the sovereign capital of Israel punctures the lie and lays a foundation for peace. It may take us years, it may take us decades, but people will look back at that moment of ending this denial of reality and people should follow America's lead, move their embassies, and in doing so they will lay more and more and more bricks for the pursuit of peace. That's another short answer to a long question. From your perspective, how does the BDS movement actually hurt Palestinians? Oh, the BD how does the BDS movement hurt Palestinians? Well, it does because it undermines the effort of, uh, of integration. Look, the uh, Palestinians, to have an economic future, they really need to be connected to Israel. And these efforts of people, which I spoke about before, this anti-Semitic movement that seeks to boycott Israel, um, it's, look, BDS is not an economic threat to Israel. Those people who, don't un who, who, who think so don't realize what is actually happening in terms of the Israeli economy and Israeli technology. The reason why people are investing in Israel is not, as I say, because they're Zionists. If it were, BDS would be a threat to Israel's economy. They invest there, and the Apples and Googles and Intels and all these companies come to Israel not because they've just read Herzl's The Jewish State. It's because they want access to one of the most innovative workforces on the planet, because they want their companies to succeed against their competitors. So economically, we'll be fine. The reason why BDS is a, a problem is because it tries to turn Israel into a pariah state. It's a moral assault on Israel's legitimacy and must be confronted in moral terms. But the one people who will be most affected if BDS does succeed in this or that effort, will actually be the Palestinians themselves, where you'll have a couple hundred jobs that the Palestinians are working in a factory, and all of a sudden the factory moves from one part of Israel to the next, 
or from Judea and Samaria to inside. You had the case of Soda Stream, was a, a more well-known case. And all that does is hurt their uh, livelihood. Uh, and it's unfortunate. And so many of these things, they just end up becoming um, self-defeating strategies for the Palestinians. Uh, they first tried to destroy us on the battlefield, they failed. They then tried to, you know, economically put a noose around their necks, our necks, they're failing. Now the latest effort is to try to turn Israel into this pariah state through the BDS movement by working on campuses to convince people that the Jewish state is this force for great evil in the world, to make people embarrassed, to throw around words like apartheid, genocide. Israel must be the dumbest genocidal force in history because the Palestinians are about five times the size that they were in 1948. So we're really doing a terrible job of trying to wipe them out. And the reason why we're doing a terrible job is we're not trying to wipe them out. We're trying to make peace with them. But the attacks and the assault continues. And the worst thing is when we believe the outrageous libels against us. Don't do it. The worst thing that happened to the Jews besides the physical assaults is when they internalize the attacks against them. When they internalize the libels against them. You know, a great Zionist writer from a century ago, over a century ago, named Achad Am, it was sort of Herzl's foil. Herzl wanted to, Achad Am was a, a very educated, a scholarly Jew named Asher Ginsberg, who was like a Talmudist. And he became secular and was a fantastic writer. If you've never read any of his essays, you, you should read them. But he's interested in preserving Jewish civilization. And Herzl said, well, first let's preserve some Jews before we preserve Jewish civilization. That was the debate between them. But Achad Am wrote a very interesting essay that I read many years ago about how the blood libel had done something wonderful for the Jewish people. And you ask yourself, what could the blood libel have done for the Jewish people? He said, well, what it did for the Jewish people was very interesting because in the Middle Ages, most people believed that the blood libel was true. And not just the ignorant masses. I'm talking about the educated people in Europe thought that the blood libel was true. And he said the blood libel taught the Jews an important lesson. Because when everyone tells you that you're wrong, a normal person will start to doubt themselves, will start to question themselves. But all the Jews knew that the blood libel was a lie. So it, he writes this over a century ago. He said, the blood libel did a wonderful service to the Jewish people despite all the pogroms and all the massacres and everything that went along with it because it taught the Jewish people that the whole world could believe something and that the whole world would be wrong. And I remember 15 years ago, I was watching television and I saw that we then had a, you remember a wave of terrorism between 2000 and 2002 and Israel had this, this interesting idea that the way to actually fight terrorism and defeat it was to actually fight it and defeat it. And so we launched Operation Defensive Shield, and we went into a lot of Palestinian areas and towns, and we went into one of the worst places, Janine, which had more suicide bombers come from there than any other place. And it was awful. But immediately, as Israel's soldiers went in, and we're trying to go through, I mean, we did something that other countries, you have to understand this, I spoke about Israel's values before. Other countries don't fight terrorism like Israel. Most countries would go into a densely populated urban place filled, a hornet's nest of terrorism by just basically dropping bombs from the sky and leveling it. That's what most countries would do. Moral nations would drop flyers and then bomb it and flatten it. What Israel did was we sent our young soldiers into this hornet's nest 
to prevent civilians on their side from being killed, meaning you're risking the lives of your own soldiers in order not to harm civilians on the other side. No nation in history, and it's not even close, has worked so hard to prevent civilian casualties of its enemies. It is not even close. And we went into this area of Janine, and the press, we kept out because we didn't want them to be casualties. And then there were all these libels that came about how many people were being slaughtered. Thousands, 5,000. And then, I think it was Saib Erekat, if I remember correctly, who only lies when he speaks, by the way. <laughs> he said, I think 500 people were killed. Now, it turns out that the UN, that great friend of Israel, did a report, and I think 54 people were killed, something like 48 or 49 of them were armed, which is also remarkable in warfare. But at the time, there was this libel against Israel, and it was spreading really fast through the British press, some of the American press. It was awful. And I remember watching television. It was 2002, April or May, and Kofi Annan, who was not a great force of moral clarity when he was the UN Secretary General. That is certainly not his legacy. He came out to a podium filled with microphones. All the press was there. And he talked about and basically continued this libel. And he asked this question, and I remember it like it was yesterday. All these attacks against Israel and what we were doing in Janine. A modern day blood libel. He said this, and I asked the people of Israel, can the whole world be wrong? And the answer is yes. The whole world could be wrong. And we as Jews should not internalize the lies of our enemies. And we certainly should not promote them among ourselves. And the most important thing that you can do is to educate yourself. And also, and I'll end with this, is to be pro-Israel. And I, you ask me how I define Zionism, I'll say what it means to be pro-Israel. To me. It's not about your position on the nuclear deal with Iran. It's not on whether or not you support a Palestinian state or two-state solution. It's not on your view of the settlement. It's one question. One question. Do you want to believe the best about Israel? or do you want to believe the worst about Israel? If you want to believe the best about Israel, then you're pro-Israel. And if you want to believe the worst about Israel, then you're anti-Israel. And when you see a headline, and the headline says, Israeli naval commandos aboard vessel bound for Gaza and kill 11 Turkish peace activists, do you say to yourself, yeah, I can see that, then you're anti-Israel? Or do you say to yourself, wait a second, something's wrong with that story. That can't be right. This is a moral nation. And did you find, find the facts? Before you pull that trigger and criticize the country that we are blessed, the sovereign Jewish state that we are a blessed generation to have, Give Israel the benefit of the doubt. Make sure that your children and your grandchildren give Israel the benefit of the doubt. We've earned it. In Israel, we've earned it. And you've earned it. The Jewish people have earned it. And that will help secure this great dream for generations and generations to, to come. Forget about what our enemies have to say. Let's believe in the justice of our own cause. We'll do all right with that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.